Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew's gospel, uh, the 27th chapter, beginning in the 62nd verse. Matthew 27, verse 62, going all the way through Matthew 28, um, and, and well into chapter 28. Uh, but it's an important story. It's a story that we cannot tell too often, and quite frankly, I'm pretty sure it's a story you came to hear this morning. So out of respect for the reading and hearing of God's word, I invite you to stand as you're able. If you'll bear with me for a moment, we're going we're gonna to back up just a little bit in the text this morning, and you'll see why in a moment. The next day, that is, the day after preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that imposture and what he said while he was still alive. He said that after three days he would rise again. Therefore, command the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might go and steal him away and tell the people that he has indeed been raised from the dead, and the last deception would be worse than the first. And Pilate responded, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, you make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard, and they made the tomb secure. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake For an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards shook and were paralyzed. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has been raised from the dead just as he told you. Come, see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has been raised from the dead, and indeed that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him. This is my message for you. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they too will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest everything that had happened. After the chief priest had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give large sums of money to the soldiers and to tell them, you must say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble." So they took the money and did just as they were told. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it's not enough that Ariel is just the most incredibly talented human being in the world and that he, along, yes, thank you, you can say amen to that. And that he anchors our worship alongside our incredibly talented choir. And we get the, the blessings of having our, our quintet come in on Easter and on Christmas to, to even further enhance the beauty of our music. But he's also a theologian. And he's a theologian that when he's working out on Super Bowl Sunday and watching the Super Bowl, he sends an email to his pastor saying, I just saw a commercial Did you see it? You need to watch it again because I think there's something in there. How many of you watched the Super Bowl this year? A lot of people. How many of you, you know, they call Easter Sunday the Super Bowl Sunday of the church year, right? That's our our big day of the year. There was a commercial for the Coca-Cola company. How many of you remember seeing, I've got some hands, the, the Super Bowl Coke commercial? So the beginning of the commercial is, is just terribly difficult as people are arguing and, and, and the internet is being used in mean and hateful and terrible ways. And then the camera focuses in on a server room and a young technician is, is plugged into the server 
um, and he's doing something and he takes a sip of his Coke and he sits the Coke down on the rack and a dr- drop of Coke, and the Coke drops, knocks over and spills and the Coke but falls on a, on a chip, on a card, on a board in that server. And, and a little spark happens and you start to see light kind of spread out and emanate from that space. And then there's a whole rack of Cat5 wires that are shaking and suddenly light travels along wires all over the world and those messages of hate and bitterness and anger slowly, one device at a time, turn to messages of hope and love and encouragement. It seems that a little dab of what it is a sweet southern concoction had the power to transform the world. But we've read the story this morning that really has the power to transform the world. Think with me a few moments this morning. It was already too late because this story had to be told. There was a, back in the late 60s and and early 70s, there were these people called phone freaks. And the phone freaks had figured out a way and devised a system by which they could hack telephone systems. We think of hacking as being a relatively new thing that people do, but going all the way back to the late 60s and 70s. And do you know where they began the hack? in a box of Captain Crunch cereal. Yeah, it's true. In a box of Captain Crunch cereal, there was a, 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 a bosun pipe, a little plastic whistle that was a toy that children would get in a box of Captain Crunch. And there was a man named John Draper who figured out that that pipe pitch was exactly 2,600 hertz. It just so happens that that was the same frequency that most of the tones on telephone lines worked off of. And if you remember making phone calls back when they were attached to walls with wires and had dials and buttons on them, (laughs) right? You would pick up your phone, and if you made a long-distance call, you would hear these tones in the background. Well, Draper built something called a blue box. Okay, ladies, don't get excited in that kind of blue box. (laughs) But it was a blue box. And if you remember, do you remember the first modems? And and they were like a little plastic thing with two rubber circles on them. And you took that handset, that big handset, and you, you put the handset in there and it made all these crazy noises. So a little blue box looked like that. It had, it had, a keypad on it, and it had a a little thing that would go over the mouthpiece of one of those handsets. And what they could do is bypass the phone company. October edition of Esquire magazine in 1971, two months before I was born, a young student at Berkeley by the name of Steve Wozniak picked up the Esquire magazine off his mother's kitchen table and he read about Captain Crunch and Captain Crunch's ability to hack the phone system. Steve was so excited, he called his 17-year-old high school buddy, Steve Jobs. And he says, you're never gonna believe what I just read. We've gotta go figure it out. They met at the, the library at Stanford, at the the particle accelerator where they smashed atoms. It had one of the largest technical libraries in the world, and they dug through the the stacks. I mean, doesn't this all just seem like, like eons ago? Handheld telephones, libraries, book stacks. And they found a book that contained within it all of the specifications for the tones that phone companies used to transmit long distance phone calls. So they set, aside, they set about to build a little blue box. Wozniak was always the technically more adept of the two. 
And, and they built the first analog box, and, and with capacitors and the various analog components, they couldn't dial in specifically on the frequency, and so they built the world's first digital blue box. And as it's Easter, I will share with you that their, their favorite and most famous prank was using the blue box to call the Vatican. Steve Wozniak pretended to be Henry Kissinger, and he asked for the Pope, and the Pope was summoned from his room at 4.30 in the morning. Later in an interview, Steve Jobs said, had it not been for the blue box, oh, and by the way, Steve Jobs, always seeing an opportunity, said that they figured out you could build one of these blue boxes for about $100. And here's where Steve Jobs saw the power. He said, with a $100 device, a couple of kids from California can control hundreds of millions of dollars of phone infrastructure throughout the world. And that has value. And Steve Jobs put that value to $170, and they sold $6,000 worth of these illegal devices. And he said in an interview later about the blue boxes and Steve Wozniak and this whole crazy idea, if not for the blue box... Apple would have never existed. Think about that for a minute. What it really goes back to is a plastic whistle and a box of Captain Crunch. And from that, I have this. Now Shannon makes sure I keep on task, and she says, that's a great story, but how in the, what in the world does it have to do with the gospel message this morning? Let me tell you what it has to do with the gospel message this morning. We read the gospel message and we know how the women went to the tomb on that first day with fear and trepidation because Jesus had been killed and they wanted to go and make sure that his body had been properly prepared. But here's the interesting part of this story. It never occurred to them that Jesus might actually raise from the dead like he had said, yet... The religious leaders, the chief priests and the Pharisees were quite scared that even if he wasn't risen from the dead, that someone might try to make it look like he had so that that story might get told. One of the greatest quotes I know is, information is knowledge and knowledge is power information about who Jesus really was, knowledge about what he really did, and the fact that he rose from the dead was the most powerful message the world would ever hear. And those in power at the time would not, could not allow that message to get out. But here's the problem. It was too late The power of the message coming from an angel descending from heaven, an earthquake that was so powerful that it rendered the guards, as it says in one translation, like dead men. They were literally paralyzed by the power of the message. And then this angel speaks to the women who had come and says... He is not here. He is risen just as he said. There was a really bad made-for-TV movie about the whole Steve Jobs incident uh, called Pirates of Silicon Valley. A young Steve Jobs, uh, our young Noah Wiley played Steve Jobs. And and Steve Jobs' character in in the Pirates of Silicon Valley he, he's, he's, he's contemplating the power of what they've been able to do right after they've pulled their prank on the Pope. And, and again, it's really not a good movie. And you'll, when I read this dialogue, you will pick it up. But it says, it's like those weird countries, man, where the army guys overthrow the president. The first thing that they take over are the ways people communicate. You know, radio, TV, Newspapers, information is power. I intentionally waited till this morning to see how the message is 
resonating today. And I encourage you, if you've got a smartphone right now and you want to check me out on this, if you go to the AJC.com this morning, nothing on there, at least before I came in to worship about Easter. Not the first story. CNN, Fox News, and Huffington Post, all three had stories. CNN and Fox News were both about the Pope's Easter message and a message of peace and, and, and encouragement for peace throughout the world, but particularly with the nuclear talks that have been going on about Iran's nuclear capacity. Easter, believe it or not, was twending, trending on Twitter this morning. A couple of them were positive. One of them was just Easter. One of them was Resurrection Sunday. Where, but one of them, believe it or not, was Jesus pickup lines. So those who might seek to poke fun at the faith were having a good time on Twitter this morning. On Facebook, trending, Easter was eighth on the list behind, among other things, the outcome of the national semifinals in the NCAA tournament last night. So here's the thing. Some 2,000 years later, a few women went to a tomb and an angel told them a story that they told the disciples who told their friends who told their friends and it went from friend to friend and town to town and country to country. But here's my fear, folks. We live in a world where information is disseminated more easily and, and, and more profoundly than it ever has been before. Yet it seems as on Easter Sunday, the Easter message is being lost among all of the other things going on in the world. We have the power to communicate with people all around the world from right where we stand. The most oppressive governments in the world understand that the best way to control things is to control information. And here's our challenge this morning, church. Our challenge is that the church must control the message of the resurrection. And when I say control it, I mean we must be good stewards of it. We must share the good news. And if I take us back to Monday, Thursday, as I've done already a couple times in this service, here's the message of the gospel, as concise as it can ever be. Jesus said, Love each other as I have loved you. And later in John's gospel, he says, no greater love have, has a person than this than they would lay down their life for their friends. So we come full circle. We come full circle to an advertisement and a game with billions of eyes on it. And what Coca-Cola was trying to say was, what needs to go viral is a message of love and peace and hope and forgiveness. And that is the gospel message. The religious leaders and the guards sought to keep the message from getting out. But it was too late because that message had already gone viral. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.